Good morning. Good morning. When Sharon was telling us about the emergency and what to do, I was reminded I was doing a keynote in Christchurch, New Zealand, and the person similar to Sharon got up and started advising us what to do in case of an earthquake. <laughs> Being from Colorado, I wasn't used to hearing that. Got a little shook up, so thank you, Sharon, for not talking about earthquakes this morning. I just wanted to point out before I start how very relevant what we're talking about is. How many of you saw this morning's issue of USA Today? Well, if you turn to the fourth page, which is now number five, excuse me, <laughs> you'll see that yesterday our Secretary of Education was before Congress talking about the horrible discriminatory rates of suspension in schools all across the country. The topic we're here about today is very current very urgent, and as our Secretary of Education says, very distressing. So it's very relevant that we're here today. It's not just a nice topic. It's not just something that it's great to be here. But the reason this room is full is because of this. It's urgent that we address this issue. I am privileged to be here today to share with you some ideas about rethinking discipline by implementing restorative justice principles and practices. These ideas are based on research conducted over the past 13 years. Before I share those ideas, though, I want to thank some organizations for making it possible to be here today. And before I start that, I want to thank the person signing. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, that in New Zealand, uh, sign language is an official language in uh, New Zealand. So uh, I'm very used to having a, a sign person in New Zealand, not the United States. So thank you for arranging for that. I'm grateful for the people in these organizations who collaborated, as you've heard, to support the project I'm going to talk about. I'm particularly su impressed that support for this work comes from organizations in both education and justice. This sort of collaboration between education and justice organizations is unique in the United States and is needed in order to address the school to prison pipeline. I brag about what's going on in this area all across the country. You are leading the country in the work that you are doing. We talk in schools often about best practices. You're modeling best practices right here today, and I commend you for it. Today I want to start by posing the question, why do we want to rethink discipline in the first place? This short podcast will explain why it is important that we address this question if we want to stop discriminatory discipline policies.
These statistics answer the question about why we are rethinking discipline today. Now I'd like you to turn to your folder, and in that folder you'll find a letter. It's called the Dear Colleague Letter. I'm not asking that you read it now, but if you would have it in hand and please read it after this session today in its entirety. These data are the reason the United States Departments of Education and Justice in January 2014 jointly published a non-discriminatory discipline policy in the form of a Dear Colleague letter. The basis of this policy is research showing that children of color are disciplined more often and more harshly than their white counterparts in school. So let's start to explore this issue by watching this video. The Obama administration made a big move today on the question of school discipline policies around the country. It issued new guidelines to urge school administrators to ensure they are not being overly zealous with strict punishments for students that are sometimes called zero tolerance rules. The Departments of Education and Justice warn schools to make sure they are being fair and equitable and that they are complying with civil rights laws. Two years ago, the NewsHour's Tom Bearden looked into a story in Texas that was drawing international attention to the unintended consequences of such policies, often for minority students. 17-year-old Diane Tran is still upset after spending 24 hours in jail for missing class. The 11th grade honor student in Willis, Texas was locked up for contempt of court after being warned by a justice of the peace to stop skipping school. The judge who issued that warning in April sentenced her to jail last month when the absences continued. If you let one of them run loose, what are you going to do with the rest of them? Let them go too. But after Houston's KHOU reported her story, the international spotlight fell on Tran and Texas's school truancy laws. Laws that were originally crafted in the mid-19th century to keep kids in class and prevent parents from pulling them out to work in the fields and then later in factories. But for students like Tran, life is more complicated than it used to be. She is a straight A student who holds down two jobs in order to help support her younger sister and another sibling in college. The judge had warned me about missing too many days of school, but I just couldn't help it. Tran says that schedule led to more than 10 unexcused absences in six months, which under Texas law can warrant criminal class C misdemeanor charges, fines up to $500, and potentially jail time. After the news spread, the judge ended up removing the citation from her record. But the case sparked a new debate about the merits of criminalizing student behavior. The new guidance calls for clearer distinctions about the role of safety personnel and making sure school administrators handle routine discipline problems instead of turning them over to law enforcement. Ari Serena Bossett in our New York studio explores the potential impact of these guidelines. We get two views now. Sherilyn Eiffel is president of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and Chester Finn is president of the Fordham Institute, which focuses on the reform of elementary and secondary education. So, Ms. Eiffel, let me start with you. How big of a problem is this? What's the administration reacting to with these guidelines? Well, the administration today really took the important step, step of recognizing what is a widespread problem. What we saw in the clip is just the tip of the iceberg, not only in Texas, but in states throughout this country. Uh, we litigated a case in, in Bryan, Texas, where uh, students can get a Class C misdemeanor ticket for using profanity uh, in, in high school. And this essentially then leaves students with a record um, and puts students on that school-to-prison pipeline that we talk about. This whole idea of discipline, of, of changing what used to be infractions that got you sent to the vice principal's office and criminalizing them, has essentially introduced the criminal justice system into our schools to the detriment of our children. Uh, and so what the administration really did today was to acknowledge this widespread problem, to take responsibility for investigating the results of these problems, 
and really trying to provide a framework for schools to think about how they can find alternative means to deal with what are real issues, discipline problems in the school, to train uh, police, uh, to, to train school police, to train teachers, to train counselors, to know how to deal with the problems that cause students to misbehave in school, or in the case of the student we saw, to miss school. Mr. Fenn, what about this idea that there is this school to prison pipeline and we're over criminalizing uh, disciplinary behavior which could have been dealt inside the school? A lot of it can be dealt with inside the school. Uh, there are also a lot of pipelines into prison, not just from schools. There's poverty, there's uh, uh, gangs, there's uh, neighborhoods, there's bad parenting, there are any number of things that contribute to, to prison. Um, and if all that the administration had done was to offer schools guidelines on how to handle discipline better, uh, this probably would be a positive step, but uh, there's, a, there's a huge iron fist inside this glove, and it's in the joint guidance from the Justice Department and the Education Department, saying if you punish uh, some kids more than you punish other kids and cannot prove that you did not intend to discriminate, we're going to come after you and ding you as schools or school systems. Uh, this is fundamentally a civil rights enforcement step of the of, of the kind that is ultimately going to weaken discipline in our schools at a very time when things like Newtown uh, ought to have us um, seeking better order in our schools rather than discouraging school systems from enforcing discipline. Ms. Eiffel, are there two different types of violence that we should be targeting? Uh, absolutely. It's difficult to imagine how discipline schools would have changed what happened in, in Newtown. We're talking about out of school suspension for children who disrupt the class or who are using profanity or who are called insubordinate. In Maryland in, uh, 2000, in the 2011-2012 school year, 675 kindergarten students were given out of school suspension for infractions like um, using foul language or not respecting the teacher. Uh, this is what we're really talking about. The school shootings are absolute tragedies. Uh, and absolutely have to be dealt with and addressed in terms of safety. But the issue we're talking about is discipline as it relates to students within the schools. And we shouldn't overreact or misguide our reaction to the tragedy that happened in Newtown by tightening the, the, the vice of discipline uh, in the schools and criminalizing discipline in the schools. And that's why this, these guidelines are so welcome. It's absolutely true. This is a civil rights enforcement issue, and it's an important issue because the disproportionate burden of this harsh, uh, a criminalization of, of discipline falls on minority students, falls on African American students, falls on Latino students, and as we saw uh, in the clip that you showed, falls on Asian American students. So some of what's suggested in the guidelines and suggested by uh, the Department of Justice uh, today is the training for school personnel to even understand how they're doing what they do. Uh, they're not going to come in and sue the school districts. The first step they say explicitly in the guidelines is to work with schools to try and find a voluntary means of using alternative measures to deal with discipline, discipline problems. Mr. Fed, what about the notion that uh, Secretary Duncan uh, impressed upon everyone over and over again that they're looking for locally developed approaches, that there isn't one blanket policy. Is it possible? Well, what they've done is to discourage locally developed remedies by setting forth so many norms and requirements and documentation obligations uh, and uh, uh, data gathering uh, requirements that the practical effect of this in our schools and school systems um, is going to be to deter school systems from developing workable discipline policies that ensure that the kids who do behave are going to be able to sit in orderly classrooms and listen to hear their teacher and uh, and, and do their homework. So I, I think Arnie Duncan's um, words are exactly right, but I think that the effect of his and the Attorney General's actions is going to be precisely the opposite. Ms. Eiffel, what about this idea that we've heard from teachers uh, saying, you know what, sometimes getting a student out of the class is the only way that I can try and retain any semblance of order in the class, that I, I could really would prefer to outsource this. I'm not a security professional. I can't deal with all of it. Yeah, you know, in cases of violence, no one's suggesting that uh, you don't need school police. In fact, we're not suggesting you shouldn't have them. Uh, there's a difference between a student who is violent and a student who uses profanity, or a student who can't sit in their seat, or a student who doesn't show up for class. And in fact, actually, the, the very opposite happened uh, of what Mr. Finn said. In fact, 
Arnie Duncan and the administration based a lot of their uh, ideas for the guidelines today on the experience of what happened in Baltimore City, where organizations like OSI Baltimore and the Advancement Project worked with the school system to try and change the school discipline code to get rid of out-of-school suspensions. And a lot of the successes in Baltimore, that's the reason why they held the announcement there today, uh, really impressed the administration. And that's why they've emphasized the idea of local changes, because they were impressed with what happened in one American city that figured out how to bring down out-of-school suspensions by working with the school district. Mr. Fenn, what, what do you think could attack some of these intense disparities, even between states or even within districts, for why some schools and some students are suspended so much more often than others? Well, what won't attack them is uh, 20 pages of gotcha guidance from the Justice Department and the Education Department, which is part of what uh, the administration released today. Uh, what will uh, tackle them is both education of education personnel and uh, school safety personnel, there's no doubt about that, uh, and advice as to what a good discipline policy looks like, all of which is excellent. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it's the people that run our 50,000 school, sorry, 50,000 student school districts that have to come up with these policies, and it's the principals of schools with 800 or 1,800 kids in them uh, that have to know how to enforce these. And uh, uh, fear of Uncle Sam is not going to make them do a better job. It is going to chill their ability to do any job at all in this realm. Chester Finn and Sherilyn Eiffel, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Research clearly shows there is a relationship between how children are treated in schools and the number of juveniles involved in the legal system. In the current climate of zero tolerance in schools, this outcome particularly applies to young persons who have been minoritized racialized and marginalized. That is, young people who suffer from a social order that supports systemic discrimination based on differences due to minority status, race, and living on the more margins of society. Research shows that using zero tolerance policies to respond to violent and nonviolent behaviors in schools appears to be in opposition to the fundamental purposes of public education, and in particular to the purposes of building students' capacity to live as contributing members of a democratic society. Traditionally, schools have relied on rules and regulations to create norms of behavior. When students do not follow these rules and regulations, they are punished. In this way, it is believed students will behave appropriately in the future. In a school climate such as this, school discipline policies and practices based on zero tolerance and the presence of police are criminalizing our schools and breaking down relationships. As student behavior improves in the classroom, the incidence of student behavior problems outside of the classroom, that is on the playground in the playing fields, grows. Rather than helping our students learn how to build and maintain healthy and caring relationships. These harsh policies are creating exclusionary schools where the good students are separated from the bad. As a result, the code of conduct for students is based on not getting caught rather than making choices based on moral reasoning. To illustrate the problem, Please pay attention to this video. Despite a 
shared societal commitment to educating all children, racialized discipline disparities serve as a barrier to educational opportunity for many students of color. Whether we're talking about suspensions, expulsions, or other forms of discipline, students of color are disproportionately disciplined relative to their white peers. For example, national data from the 2011-2012 academic year indicates that African American students were suspended and expelled at rates three times higher than their white peers. Many reasons have been offered to explain this alarming disproportionality in school discipline. Here at the Kerwin Institute, we seek to raise awareness of implicit racial bias as a contributing factor to these disparities. Implicit biases are attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. They are activated involuntarily and without individuals' awareness or intentional control. Implicit racial biases can operate in many ways within the educational environment, such as affecting how teachers perceive student behavior. The teacher workforce in the U.S. is largely comprised of white females, while the youth population of this country is increasingly diverse. This can produce a cultural mismatch in which teachers' implicit racial biases cause them to misinterpret student behavior. Consider a situation in which a white teacher observes non-white students engaging in a loud and lively debate. Rather than viewing the scene merely as reflecting the passionate views of the participants, the teacher's implicit biases may influence him or her to perceive the students to be interacting in an aggressive or contentious manner and send them off to the principal's office or school resource officer for reprimand. In situations such as this, students in schools with zero tolerance discipline policies are likely to be subjected to automatic punishments. Thus, influenced by implicit biases, a teacher's decision to refer students to the office can mean that they are ultimately pushed out of the classroom via out-of-school suspensions or expulsions. For some students, lost classroom instruction time has devastating implications, such as falling behind their peers academically or leading them to drop out of school entirely. Disciplines such as this, particularly for non-violent offenses, can be a pivotal moment that places students on the school-to-prison pipeline. Addressing how implicit racial biases can operate in the school context is an important opportunity to reflect on the origins of discipline disparities and ultimately reduce the flow of students into this pipeline. As the Kerwin Institute works to create a just and inclusive society where all people and communities have opportunity to succeed, we are committed to raising awareness of the distressing impacts of implicit racial bias. We encourage you to explore the various materials on this webpage to learn more. the solution to these problems? One answer, and the answer adopted by the schools represented here today, is to change the culture of the school to a culture of care, based on restorative justice principles and practices. At the core of a culture of care is the idea of building healthy and caring relationships. In alignment with this fundamental idea of building healthy and caring relationships, changing the culture of a school to a culture of care is based first on an ethic of care, that is, caring for students' well-being as a key role for teachers. Second, a culturally responsive pedagogy of relations. That is, placing relationships at the center of teaching and learning. And finally, restorative practices. That is, focusing on repairing the harm, particularly 
two relationships when conflict and wrongdoing occur. These three theories form the conceptual framework for a culture of care. Valenzuela's interpretation of what caring means in schools guides this change in school culture. This description of caring calls for teachers to embrace two kinds of caring. Authentic caring, where educators in the participating schools care for their ethnically diverse students as culturally located individuals with an emphasis on reciprocal relationships and interactions between the students and their teachers. And aesthetic caring, where these educators care for the learning of these students based on a commitment to ideas and practices that purportedly lead to improved educational outcomes for these ethnically diverse students. Research is clear that both kinds of caring are needed. Students want their teachers to care for their learning as well as to care for them as culturally located individuals. A culture of care based on restorative justice principles and practices is best suited to meet these needs. So now, let's turn to talk about the school that Lori mentioned as an example of best practices for using restorative justice principles and practices. In particular, I want to draw your attention to the example of Hinckley High School. This school is located in Aurora, Colorado, a suburb of Denver. This school is where the Culture of Care project was piloted. The results of the research and professional development project formed the basis for the work being done here. Now curbing conflicts in high school. Hari Srinivasan looks at a new approach to discipline that replaces suspensions with conversations. In Aurora, Colorado, Principal Matthew Willis welcomes the recent changes at Hinkley High School, where 75% of the 2,000 plus students qualify for free and reduced meals. Willis says student fights are down and respect among classmates is up. Last year we had a 48% reduction in out of school suspensions when it came to physical altercations between um, students. In 2007-8 we had approximately uh, 263 um, physical altercations and so far for this year we've only had 31 physical altercations. So good morning, thank you for being here. The turnaround, he says, began when Hinkley High started using a form of discipline called restorative justice. Every single year over the last three full years that we've been doing restorative justice, you see significant declines in defiance, disobedience, and uh, use of profanity. This is called a talking circle, so when we have problems in the school, we come together and talk about it. Now, when a minor altercation does occur, students, parents, and the dean face each other in a restorative circle. The story of it is that you bring back the kids, if it's student with student, or if it's student with staff, you restore the relationship. So if there's conflict or wrong, wrongdoing, we come together and we talk about it and we try to heal the harm that was caused from the incident. So thank you for everything you said so far. And now this Dean of Students part. Bonnie Martinez facilitates. We speak openly and honestly, but with respect. On the day we visited, two sophomore girls caught up in a physical fight were brought to a circle with their parents instead of being suspended. So this is our talking stick. So who's ever holding this is the ones talking and everyone else is listening. You say what happened from your point of view, and you say what happened from your point of view. And sometimes we don't always agree on all the facts or whatever. She called me the B word, and then, um, and then we just started fighting. That's kind of a lie of you. She say to be honest, and I think you have to be honest. I was here, and she come walking to me, and so she started arguing. Students are asked to talk about the harm their actions may have caused, and Martinez requires everyone to sign an agreement. What do you take responsibility for? What do you think we could do to help the harm that was caused? 
I'm sorry for having these problems that we've been having. And I don't want it to happen again. Okay, you're not gonna be enemies, but you're gonna treat others with respect. That, to some people, may be viewed as a soft discipline, especially if you look at the Western culture. You know, we're about war and violence, we're not about peace and harmony. But however, for those girls to come together and for their families to come together and talk about it and to really, you know, to express truly what happened, how did it affect me and others, what am I responsible for and how do I solve it, that's, that's deeper than just writing up paperwork and one person goes their way and the other person goes their way and nothing was ever communicated. What do we know about anger? It's a secondary feeling. What is underneath anger? A lot of deeper emotions and feelings. At Hinkley, the restorative justice circles go beyond the dean's office. Peer mentoring classes use role playing to teach students how to conduct circles on their own. How does it make you feel? It pisses me off that he's very nervous about me. But I didn't do nothing big. Sophomore Nice Smith thinks the circles bring better results than suspension. It used to be like you just get sent home for five days, but that doesn't resolve nothing. You just sit there and you come back with the same anger. When teachers don't resolve the harm by doing restorative justice, then that conflict is always there. And usually what will happen is kids will just stay angry. And I don't like that teacher, and so I don't care what you say, and they'll just <laughs> disrupt, disrupt, disrupt. I'm deeply sorry about what's going on. Models like Hinckley's have gained national attention after the Obama administration in January directed school districts to scrap overly zealous zero tolerance policies that led to automatic suspensions and criminal records. Such policies, the official said, impacted minorities at higher rates. Colorado's legislature eliminated zero tolerance in schools in 2012. The ideas of traditional discipline don't exist anymore. When um, in the old days, we, when a student <coughs> got into trouble, we would spank them. And we moved away from spanking because it no longer met the values of our society. The same is true with a traditional discipline where it's all about punishment, punishment, punishment. It's not about restoring relationships. It's not about taking responsibility for your actions. It's about punishment. And so that no fits the society of our future. What, what this is society of our future is people coming together and working and solving problems together. Gracias. And while Colorado is now ahead of the national movement, the state actually played a role in the making of zero tolerance policies after the 1999 shootings at Columbine High School. Anytime you're in a school, you've got all these stakeholders. Sarah Park is the director of education for the Denver Foundation one of the sponsors of Hinckley's restorative justice program. In Colorado, our zero tolerance law was really in response to Columbine. And um, we were scared. We were all heartbroken. We were terrified. And we wanted to make sure kids were safe. And so we thought, well, let's do this. Let's make sure, let's make clear that this is non-negotiable. And, and that's really where the intention around zero tolerance came from. Unfortunately, the way it played out was was in more negative educational outcomes. You can't learn if you're not there. And they also, there's there's studies linking suspension to incarceration. And it's much more likely that a kid is suspended and repeatedly suspended that they'll end up in jail. Um, and it's much more likely that if they're suspended even once in ninth grade, they're more likely to drop out. Aurora police officer Jake Bunch, who's assigned to Hinckley High School, says social media has accelerated his need to rely on personal connections that can come from restorative justice. With like Facebook and Twitter, information just spreads so quickly now that you know it's, it's, it's hard to stay on top of it because the kids know about something that's going to go down way before we could ever know. If kids, you know, if I build that relationship with them and they know they can come talk to me, before it becomes a violent issue, it ties right in with restorative justice. What is the role of an individual in society? Not all conflicts can be resolved through restorative circles. Even supporters see the process as one of many approaches. And skeptics question if stopping down class time for circles limits learning. Test scores at Hinckley High School hover below the state average. For his part, Principal Willis remains a strong believer in the approach and is sharing the school's method with districts across the state.
a couple of notes about Hinckley. The principal, Matthew Willis, greets every student every morning, over 2,000 students. He did, took that up because I recommended to the teachers that they welcome their students as they come into the classroom. I never thought Matthew would take it up to greet every student every morning. I have to tell you, he won the Assistant Principal of the Year Award the year before he became principal. He missed two days of school, and the students were all wondering where he was. How many high schools do I go into and ask the students the name of the principal and they don't know? I ask the students if they've ever met the principal, and they say no. I ask parents the same thing, I get the same answer. Matthew is different in that respect. I also want to tell you a little bit about the Denver Foundation and that mention. It was the parents that got the grant that brought us to Hinckley High School to train the teachers about restorative justice. We talk about parent involvement. I can tell you, these are parents that had only been in the United States two to three months on average. Aurora is a place where we're having people coming from Mexico, from other Latin American countries. They couldn't speak English, they didn't know our culture, but they knew what they wanted. They went and got this grant, and they got me there to Hinckley High School. We were there for three years. So that's the kind of thing that you can expect. So I want to turn and get into the details. We want to talk, oh, what did I go the wrong way? There we go. We have to talk about what's happening in the classroom to affect the change. Restorative justice practices outside the classroom are fine, but they will not change the culture of the school. We have to get into the classroom and build the capacity of teachers and students. So this is the slide we use to explain the difference between the traditional and the <laughs> restorative classroom. The traditional discourse of consequences is based on several key ideas. Traditionally, students are expected to be the passive recipients of discipline policies. Rarely do they have a voice in developing such policies. They are not given the opportunity to express their needs without the risk of repercussions. Traditionally, schools have relied on rules and regulation to create norms of behavior. When students do not follow these rules and regulations, they are punished. In this way, it is believed students will behave appropriately in the future. Normally, classrooms are structured so teachers and administrators are in control and students have little or no power or agency. Teachers are expected to maintain control of their classrooms without any outside help. They are left isolated in their classroom without opportunities for coaching or mentoring. Typically, teachers are solely responsible for what happens in their classroom. The burden of sole accountability for classroom behavior is more than some teachers are capable of handling, particularly when they have students with special needs in the classroom. In the current climate of standards and accountability, curriculum has become the focus of educators' attention. As a result, student misbehavior is viewed as disruptive to learning. Students causing problems in classrooms are removed so that the learning can continue. As a result of this response to misbehavior, students are excluded from classrooms to be disciplined by an administrative expert. Persons harmed by the misbehavior are not included in the process. They have no voice. In the end, when the student is returned to the classroom, relationships remain broken 
and the chances for a successful reintegration of the misbehaving student into the classroom are lessened considerably. The new restorative discourse offers an alternative set of ideas upon which schools can base their response to student behavior problems. Rather than promoting passivity, schools need to encourage self-advocacy, self-control, and individual dignity. I was very happy to hear that theme mentioned earlier this morning. This new discourse calls for teachers, administrators, students, and parents to co-create policies regarding responses to wrongdoing and conflict. In particular, students are given space to voice their needs and challenge the status quo in a safe environment. Relationships and interactions between teachers and students and among students are fundamental to this discourse. From student interviews, we know that relationships with teachers are important to them. And relationships with their friends is the prime motivator for why secondary students attend school. Therefore, it makes sense that educators would want to help students learn how to build and maintain healthy relationships. This new discourse calls for teachers and students to share power. In this way, students' need for self-determination is recognized and honored. Their human dignity is respected. This new discourse is based on the idea of shared responsibility for what happens in the classroom. In that way, teachers and students take responsibility for responses to wrongdoing and conflict. Shared responsibility recognizes that all people in the classroom are affected by the harm resulting from wrongdoing and conflict and need to have a voice in how to heal that harm. Wrongdoing and conflict are viewed as learning opportunities in this discourse. By actively participating in the response to these problem behaviors, both students and teachers learn how to make good choices when wrongdoing and conflict occur. They learn how to make peaceful and nonviolent choices. Building the capacity of students and teachers to solve problems nonviolently is a key result of viewing wrongdoing and conflict as learning opportunities. In this way, our classrooms become more peaceful and our children grow up more likely to confront problems as adults nonviolently. Healing the harm to relationships is fundamental to maintaining healthy relationships because students tell us that relationships with friends are important to them, we would best put our efforts in helping them learn how to heal these relationships when they are broken by the harm resulting from wrongdoing and conflict. This effort will help our children stay in school and succeed. From my field experience, I found that educators are looking for practical ways to apply restorative justice principles and practices to the day-to-day -day work of schooling. They want strategies that will help create a culture of care. Further, I found talking circles offer a practical way for teachers to implement restorative practices into their classrooms and reorient the response to problems involving student behavior. Circles offer a time for students to gather together to share their personal feelings and ideas about anything that is significant to them. By showing students that their opinions count Encouraging them to safely express feelings and make real choices 
educators can enhance students' self-esteem more effectively than a system of external rewards. Circles work best if there is a school-wide commitment to make the circle process a priority for responding to interpersonal and organizational issues that affect the school community. The circles model often consists of weekly meetings lasting half an hour to 45 minutes where students sit in a circle. These sessions involve carrying out activities, games, and the practice of speaking and listening skills while sitting in a round and using a talking stick. Circles is a group activity in which any number of people, although four to 20 participants is most practical, all sit down together with the purpose of furthering understanding of themselves and of one another. Also, circles can be used for group problem solving. Circles provide spaces where this deeper connecting can happen, where conflicts become opportunities for building relationships. Circles are a democratic and creative approach to building the capacities of teachers and students to address wrongdoing and conflict in a nonviolent way. And circles promote positive relationships and behavior, two of the most important elements for improving learning and the smooth and harmonious running of a school. So here is what a culture of care looks like in a school. Research has revealed that if restorative practices are to be focused on healing the harm into relationships, they will necessarily require the inclusion and participation of the persons harmed and the person or persons causing the harm. Normally, these persons know each other and will continue to have a relationship in the future. This is the primary reason why restorative practices is different in schools than in the legal system. In the legal system, when we do restorative justice, the people do not have a relationship or a continuing relationship generally. In schools, it is much different. We need to recognize as we apply this in our schools that it is very different in application in schools than in the legal system in this regard. Restorative practices must include all persons affected by the wrongdoing or conflict. If a student is sent outside of the classroom to an administrator or an expert to solve a problem, the people in the classroom, that is the students and the teacher, are robbed of the opportunity to build their capacity to respond nonviolently to conflict and wrongdoing and to be nonviolent, self-sustaining adults. Taking a student out of the classroom because of bad behavior and asking someone outside the classroom to address these problems is an exclusionary practice. Although the intention is to let the teachers and students in the classroom go on without interruption, in the end, this process does not address the harm to relationships resulting from the behavior. Later, when the student is returned to the classroom, without addressing the harm he or she has caused to relationships, these relationships keep on breaking down without healing. Building and maintaining respectful relationships is a key part of the role of an effective teacher. The research shows the end result often is that students are being suspended because they have no positive relationships in the school. And that's the question I ask when I'm in a school and they're about to suspend a student. 
I simply ask, does this student have any positive relationships left in this school? Generally, they'll say no. And I'll say, then our work is to make those relationships repairable before we get to this point. Thus, the adults in the school have an obligation to help these students heal broken relationships with other students and the teachers because healthy relationships are the key to success for schools. At the school-wide level, restorative practices focus on building healthy relationships through conversations and behaviors and restoring the dignity of the individuals involved and the group through the healing of broken relationships. The work of experts or practitioners, that is the administrators, the deans and so forth, is to build the capacity of the students and teachers not to be the go-to person. As was mentioned, Last August, a four-day training, the trainer professional development training was held. Participants in the training included representatives from the pilot schools and BOCES. As a result of the, that training, participants created an action plan to implement what they learned in schools during this past school year. Today, they will share some of the successes of implementing this action plan. This collaborative action is a model of best practices for implementing restorative justice principles and practices in order to create a culture of care in the participating schools. This collaboration includes state agencies related to justice and education, BOCES, and of course, the individual participating schools. Creating a culture of care at a school requires deliberate actions on the part of everyone in the school community. In particular, the leadership of the principal is the key to a culture of care being introduced at the school and becoming the basis for change in the school culture. In order to continue the profound change it is necessary to meet the needs and expectations of culturally diverse students and their parents, to reduce the tensions at the school, and to focus on bringing the changes presented today to the classroom. Thus, this recommendation is made. Focus on building the capacity of teachers and their students to respond to wrongdoing and conflict in the classroom in such a way as to address the harm that results to relationships. Training teachers and students about restorative justice practices of restorative conversations and talking circles can best accomplish this goal. As a result, discipline referrals can be greatly reduced and hopefully eliminated so that these culturally diverse students can spend most of their time in school learning. In addition to the demonstrations that will follow this address, you can learn more about this work at this website. Also, you can view the online professional development course that is similar to the four-day professional development training that I mentioned earlier and I have supplied my email address in case you want to make any inquiries. Thank you.